Hello Sector Watchers, welcome to the show. This is the 127th episode of Sector Spotlight for Tuesday the 17th of May, recording it on Monday the 16th. My name is Julius de Campenaar and I am presenting to you from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. You can find my contact details on the screen in case you would like to share any of your comments, have questions, etc, etc. Please use any of the handles on the screen. For this week, we will have a quick look at, very briefly at asset classes and then a little bit more extensive on sectors. We're going to look at a sector that is potentially starting to become interesting from a buying perspective. It's been a long time since we've done that. And then we'll spend a good chunk of time explaining the use of the dollar one benchmark as, a, as the benchmark for RRGs following the discussion uh, on an article that I wrote. So no time to lose. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sector Spotlight. For the asset class rotation, I'm very, very quickly only going to watch the daily RRG as the rotations took place last week. And we can see that especially the S&P 500 stocks and real estate ended up inside the lagging quadrant following a, uh, a weak performance and that the cluster of fixed income ETFs ended up inside the leading quadrant. We've got the commodities, DJP and GSG still going through a corrective phase and a very strong role is still there for the US dollar. Um, when we translate that to the chart of the S&P 500, uh, it's very clear that we broke below this very important support level. I think that the downside risk is, uh, is still pretty big for the S&P 500, but more importantly, the upside potential is limited to the 410, 415 area for the time being. So still uh, be very careful with the stock market. For the sectors, we had a very in-depth look at all rotations last week. So I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit um, for this week. On the left-hand side, we have the weekly relative rotation graph. And on the right-hand side, we have the daily version. Now, on the weekly version, the story remains pretty much the same. Energy still very strong going through a corrective phase all defensive sectors utility staples healthcare inside the leading quadrant meaning that they are in a relative uptrend staples very strong utilities and healthcare going through a little bit of a break uh, materials is hidden behind those in, in that cluster so it's right here very short tail very stable um, but relative uptrend versus the S&P 500. Industrials, real estate are rolling over. The offensive sectors, the growth stuff, discretionary technology, financials all in relative downtrends versus the S&P. And communication services continuing to uh, move slightly higher inside the improving quadrant, but still at a very short tail. If we put that on the daily version, then we can put all of that into perspective. And what you can see here, and I think that's an interesting one, for the energy sector, you can see that the energy sector, the weekly, the, the rotation on the daily graph, has already completed a rotation from leading through weakening and back into leading, um, which means that it will eventually move over to that weekly tail that we see here. And based on that strong rotation on the daily, I wouldn't be surprised, or better, I expect that this rotation here will soon stop declining in terms of RS momentum, pick up and rotate back into the leading quadrant once it goes through weakening. Maybe even it, maybe it doesn't even reach that, but that's very unusual. It's just underscoring the strength of the relative trend for the energy sector at the moment. If we look at the other ones, if we look at uh, staples, then you can see that, in, that the daily tail is already inside weakening and starting to curl back up. So it will very soon, if not already, start to uh, support the further rise of that weekly tail further into the leading quadrant. If we look at um, healthcare, 
then you can see that it is starting to improve here. It's starting to rotate back towards the leading quadrant. And that will certainly support the, the, the move on the weekly tail. Not very sure whether this needs to go all the way down before it runs up or whether it's going to be a, a, a quick and smooth, well, not so smooth, a quick and um, rapid improvement which will result into a little hook on the weekly tail because it will then be so quick that it doesn't show the complete rotation as you know. And the uh, utilities tail is pretty much the same. If we look at the utilities here then you can see that that's already pushing back into the leading quadrant. So um, the shorter term trends for the defensive sectors are starting to underscore and possibly help the rotations on the weekly RRG. If you look at the, um, the performance over the last five days, you can see that here healthcare staples are coming out on top and whereas utilities right here just below the S&P 500. So um, on the longer term, all defensives are still there. And if you, if you look here, healthcare utility staples and then energy at the top, and that's pretty much mimicked on the daily RRG. Now, if you look at um, a few, all right, yeah, one thing I need to tell you, the, um, the communication services sector on the weekly scale is stable there. It's now starting to roll over uh, inside the improving quadrant. So it looks as if we're gonna get another uh, down lag in terms of relative strength for the communication services sector. But I'm gonna look at the price chart in a minute because um, yes, we are, still in a weak market. Yes, the S&P 500 is in a downtrend. Most sectors are in a downtrend. Defenses are leading. But this is the time to start looking for your shopping list. This is when you need to prepare for when the market is turning around or will be turning around and see if there are any possible early turnarounds to, uh, to be spotted. I'm not saying that you gotta go all in at the moment, the good news is that if you buy now, you're not buying at the highest point in time. Um, so I am slowly starting to, uh, to look for stuff that has really gone down the drain and starting to show early signs of improvement. They go on my shopping list. And on an RRG, the blue improving quadrant is an ideal location for, um, for your shopping list. And lo and behold, the only sector inside the improving quadrant is the communication services sector. So I'm gonna look at that in a minute. If we quickly go over a few of the individual charts, here is the energy sector. As I said, um, uh, it's, it's bound to be turning around, looking at the, the rotation on the daily tail. And it's, you, you can basically see that here on this chart as well. We're still holding up the, the, the hesitation, the, 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 the move lower on the R's momentum scale is uh, caused by the pause in the, the strength of the, of the rally in terms of relative strength. And that's because of the, the little uh, sideways pause after the breakout. Uh, it looks as if we're you know, going to new highs right now. That'll eventually lead to more relative strength and that will eventually pull that momentum back up again and start pushing relative strength higher. If you look at the utility sector, let me highlight that right here. You can see it's rolling over. There is, that's the result of the, um, the little pause after the break um, uh, when it dropped back in terms of price. Relative strength um, fell back a little bit and that's being picked up by that loss in relative strength. But as you can see, they're comfortably above 100. That relative strength line, there's nothing wrong with that. It's coming out of a resistance area, pushing higher. So I think it'll be a matter of time uh, for the utility sector to start moving at a strong RRG heading, heading again further into the leading quadrant. Pretty much the same goes for the healthcare sector. The breakout and relative strength is fully intact. And you can see that the drop back uh, of RS momentum is caused by that drop back in price after testing resistance, that failed breakout. We're now back into a support area. If we hold here, then price will start to rise. That will certainly help relative strength move higher. Um, 
if, if, if it only remains here and the market goes down, then also relative strength for uh, healthcare will push higher. Uh, this is all in all a very healthy, wink, wink, uh, picture for the healthcare sector. Staples. If we look at staples, then we see a very nice, very nice, very stable uptrend, both in price and in terms of relative strength. This is one of the stronger tails at the moment, pushing higher, and it has just tested the lower, uh, the lower boundary of that rising trend channel. So all ingredients are there for a further rally in the staple sector. Uh, materials, quite the same, although at a lower pace, but it is a sector to... Um, to definitely look at from a, a positive perspective in terms of relative strength, we're testing the lower boundary. As long as that holds, that relative strength trend uh, remains intact. And now for the sector that I talked about, the communication services sector. For months, for many, many months, this was the weakest sector in the universe. We talked about it a lot. It went from weakening into lagging. It went far and deep into the lagging quadrant. That is no surprise. Look at what happened here. It is very low. However, for the recent weeks, and actually a couple of months, two months already, that, that the pace of the decline has come to a standstill. Well, not to a standstill, but it's diminishing. It's not, it's not as fast anymore. The downside momentum is fading in terms of relative strength. The angle is slowing down. And that's causing that RS momentum line to move back to the 100 level and keeping that tail very close to 100 on the momentum scale. If I look at the price chart, then we are now touching a very strong support level. Uh, level around 56, um, that area is a very strong support level in terms of price. Uh, and you know, at some stage, you gotta, you gotta start looking for buying opportunities and a, a strong support level is definitely a good place to look for, um, for buying opportunities. Now, when I was annotating my charts and going over my charts this afternoon, I noticed uh, something. I'm not a big user of, of Fibonacci, of retracements, but I looked at this move here and I thought, hey, what would that be in terms of a Fibonacci retracement? And when I... <laughs> When I brought that up, that was quite interesting because if I pull the Fibonacci retracements right here, look at this. That is bang on 61.8% Fibonacci retracement. Now, I'm not a big user of it. I'm ver very much not an expert, but this one lines up very nicely. And it's not only the 61.8 retracement, it's also a very strong support level. So... Yes, it's still in a relative downtrend. Yes, it's at very low levels, but I'm starting to develop a little interest for the communication services sector um, just because we are resting at support levels. Of course, when we, when we significantly drop below 56, 55, all bets are off and it is going further down. But for the time being, um, this is, a, this is a very early call and I'm just watching, putting this on my watch list for potentially interesting um, individual stocks or maybe the ETF as a sector for when things start to turn for the better. In last week's sector spotlight show we briefly touched upon the dollar one discussion which followed an article that i wrote uh, at the end of april which stocks inside the dow are worth holding and i i used the dollar one benchmark there to basically search for stocks that were um, in an uptrend price wise and um, for some reason whatever that would be, I got a, a few questions on whether dollar one would be the better benchmark to use. And it wasn't one. So um, that's why I thought I'd give a little bit more attention. Um, I speak about it in last week's show, but 
it was at the end of the show and I got stressed for time and I needed to finish it very rapidly and then I got another question this week so I thought uh, I'm gonna record the the use of dollar one and whether it whether it is the better benchmark or not uh, a little bit more in depth uh, today and I actually also wrote an article on that for the RRG blog which was published to, today Monday the 16th uh, when I'm recording Sector Spotlight for this week and the the honest answer is uh, the if the question is is dollar one the better benchmark to use with relative rotation graphs then the other the the honest answer is it depends it, it depends very much on um, on what your goal is what type of an investor you are and um, how you are set up and what I mean is what what first of all whether you are a professional or a retail investor that makes a huge difference um, and relative rotation graphs were first developed with the professional investor in mind and very very briefly a professional investor professional portfolio manager nine times out of ten his job his mandate is to outperform a given benchmark so portfolio manager for a US equities portfolio can very well have the mandate to outperform the S&P 500. If you're a portfolio manager for European equities, your mandate could be to outperform the stocks 50 or the stock 600. Um, if you're working for a sector portfolio and your portfolio is the, uh, the technology portfolio, your benchmark could very likely be to outperform the S&P 500 technology index. Many, many um, possibilities. But they all have in common that these professionals almost never have the ability to accumulate big cash positions in their portfolio. They need to be almost 100% invested. And that's all good when the market's going up. But when the market's going down, being 100% invested means that your portfolio will also go down. Um, that's the burden of a professional fund manager, whether that's a, um, uh, a fund that investors can invest in, it, whether it's a pension fund, whether it's, I, I don't know, there are so many different types of funds. But when the mandate is outperform that benchmark and you're not allowed to have more than, I don't know, maybe 5% in cash, then it means that when the market goes down, your portfolio will suffer. Uh, and that's why all these professionals are using relative strength to outperform their benchmark and they're in the game when when the market when the S&P 500 drops 10% and their portfolio only loses 5% they outperform the market by 5% so they are doing well they are actually beating their benchmark and they are um, satisfying their customers the, the participants in the fund even despite the fact that they lost 5% in uh, in price terms so uh, basically that is the difference between price performance and relative performance. And I just picked Amazon as an example here in this graph uh, where you can very nicely see that from mid 2020, the price of Amazon gradually rose further, but in terms of relative strength, it actually tanked. It wasn't able to keep up with the S&P 500. So when your job would be to outperform the S&P 500 over this period of time, you certainly would not have hold, uh, held Amazon in your portfolio. Now, when you are a retail investor, obviously that's a completely different um, proposal because you got a lot more leeway. Retail investors have a lot more flexibility. Um, you don't have a compliance officer. You don't have a chief investment officer. You don't have regulators. You don't have board members um, that all, you don't have customers that all look over your shoulders uh, and check whether what you are holding in the fund is in line with the marketing brochure, with the fact sheet, uh, maybe some other restraints that are put into place for your portfolio. So you've got a lot more possibility. Now, when you go in the shoes of, of a retail investor, and I, quite honestly, I think that's most of us, that's most of the people that are uh, on the channel here and are using um, the website. But and apparently appears to be, and, and I, I heard that time over time, when 
um, when the market is going up, most retail investors want to beat the market. They want to be stronger than the S&P 500. When the S&P goes up 5%, they want to go up 10%. They want to be in the strongest stocks. And that's absolutely fine. That's, that's a very legit goal. And I would actually, I'll do the same. Um, but that changes when the market goes down. When it comes to price performance, retail investors basically just don't want to lose money. They're not interested to lose 5% when the market loses 10%. In that case, they just don't want to have any stocks. They don't want to have any holdings. They just want to be in cash or they want to be in stocks that are rising despite the markets going down. Um, so that is when dollar one comes in as a potential benchmark for a relative rotation graphs. We all know that relative rotation graphs uh, usually use like the S&P 500 or a sector index for the benchmark and then we compare the universe. When you're looking for price performance, dollar one is the benchmark to use. Now, when would you do that? When would that be the better, um, the better benchmark? And basically, when the market is in an uptrend, you want to use the S&P 500 because you want to be in the strongest stocks when the market goes up. When the market is in a downtrend, then you want to use dollar one because then you don't want to lose any money in price terms. So the way to define whether a market is in an uptrend or in a downtrend obviously is very arbitrarily, it's very subjective. So just for the sake of an example, I have used a 20 week moving average as an overlay on the S&P 500. When the, when the price of the S&P 500 is above its 20 week moving average, we're in an uptrend. If the price of the S&P 500 is below the 20 week moving average, we're in a downtrend. Very simple, pick, pick any period, pick any definition of an uptrend you like. Um, but if you're wondering which benchmark to use and when, I'd suggest that when the market is in an uptrend, according to your definition, you use the S&P 500 as the benchmark. And when the market is in a downtrend, you use the S&P, you use dollar one as the benchmark. <laughs> and it can give quite uh, different results. And as, an, as a quick example, I have plotted here uh, the weekly RRG and the left one is using the S&P 500 as the benchmark and the right one is using dollar one as the benchmark. And you can see that there are some subtle differences, um, not super much yet. I mean, communication services is inside improving uh, and picking up a little bit against dollar one. It's still well inside the lagging quadrant, picking up a little bit, but not um, nowhere near an uptrend. You can see that these are all in uh, downtrends measured in price, but you can also see that industrials and real estate are in downtrends versus price, but they are still in uptrends relative to the S&P 500. That's quite interesting. It becomes even more clear when we switch to a daily RRG. And here is the daily RRG for the S&P 500 sectors. Uh, left one is a relative against SPY and the right one is price based against dollar one. And then, it then the, the difference becomes very, very clear following the, um, the last weeks of price development. This is a five, five day tail, uh, but it measures like three weeks in price uh, price terms is, is the outlook that I usually use for the trend duration. Um, and you can see that the majority of all these sectors is in a downtrend versus price. Whether when you look at it um, uh, in, uh, in relative terms, you can see that it's, it's predominantly um, a consumer discretionary and where is that? Consumer discretionary and real estate that are um, in downtrends, whether the rest is in uptrends. You can see that consumer discretionary is um, on the bottom line, minus 1.6. Financials is mi minus 1.9. That is coming down here rapidly. But you can see the difference between um, relative-based and price-based. In terms of price, energy is, is literally the only sector that is still in an uptrend on the daily price chart. Um, whether on the weekly price chart, we have a few more sectors that are still fulfilling the criteria 
of an uptrend in terms of price and there are much more uh, fulfilling the criteria of a relative uptrend versus the S&P 500. So if we wrap this up, um, when would it be a good idea to use dollar one as the benchmark, especially when the market that you're tracking, and I'm going to assume that's the S&P 500, is in a downtrend. Because dollar one helps you to find stocks or sectors that are in an uptrend based on price. So when you use dollar one, the whole relative image is off the table. Or you can say that you are uh, using relative strength versus 0% return, meaning not a loss. Anyway, I hope this, uh, this helps everybody who wrote in a question on that dollar one use, the use of dollar one uh, in that Dow article. Uh, and, and I hope that you start using it yourself. If you still have any questions, just send them to me. I'll be happy to answer them. Just don't expect it to be uh, the next day, but they will come. And that wraps up Sector Spotlight for this week. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, you know what to do. And please remember, Sector Spotlight airs every Tuesday from 10.30 to 11 a.m. Eastern here on Stock Charts Television. I'm looking forward to see you again at a new episode of Sector Spotlight. Same time, same place. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.